I was teaching a horse training clinic on a hot autumn day. The crowd was gathered around me in a semicircle of 50 or more people as we waited for the first demonstration horse. Bubba had come from the racetrack, and he was hoping to be trained to be a jumper. We heard the owner yelling from the stall, quit it, settle down, as she struggled to get the halter on him. I saw a blur of white leaping and plunging down the aisle, and she struggled to hold him with a chain lead line. They came into the arena, spinning up dust as they entered. The crowd peeled off in all directions to get out of the way. I stood calmly, looking at the horse. I could see the pain and fear in his body and his expression from his life at the racetrack. I reached down, and I picked up what I call a wand, and the horse reared straight up, pawing and snorting. The crowd moved further to get out of the way. I knelt down and picked up four wands. I took a breath. I looked deeply into Bubba's eyes. I shifted my gaze to his opposite rear hoof. I stepped forward and placed two wands on his shoulders, two wands against his haunches, and took a breath. Bubba took a breath, lowered his head, stretched his neck and top line. put my wands down and stepped forward, touched his shoulder with the back of my hand. We had made a heart connection. The crowd was amazed. This horse had regained composure so quickly from what seemed impossible four wands when he was clearly afraid of one whip. This example shows you how important it is to make connections with the animals in your life. And of course, when you're working with an animal as big as a horse, that helps keep you safe. But I want to share with you today how you can enhance the relationships with the animals in your life and why that is so significant. 68% of US households include a cat or a dog. And animals provide many health benefits for humans. They lower our heart rate, lower our blood pressure. They've helped people with post-traumatic stress, and they enhance our immune systems. And in fact, it's been shown that pets matter, especially to women, many women would report that their primary relationship is with their dog, their horse, or their cat. 40% <laughs> of women, in fact, say they get more emotional support from their dog than from their husband or their family. And 90% of pet-owning families say that their dog or cat is indeed a member of the family. Animals are also far more intelligent than prior studies have ever led us to believe. I learned about the limitless potential of animal intelligence from my rabbits. I was a recent college grad, and I was living in an apartment complex that didn't allow pets. No dogs, no cats. Nothing on the lease about rabbits. So I welcomed a rabbit into my home. I wanted to relate to this rabbit, Agatha, as I had with my dogs and horses, and so I treated her like she was a dog. I taught her to play catch with a milk cap. She learned how to sit up and lay down when I ask and come when I called, and she expressed disapproval with me by pinning her ears and snarling her nose at me. I found out that she loved banana chips, and I used those to entice her to follow me around the apartment, and pretty soon I got a small leather cat harness, and I was able to take Agatha for walks. Soon thereafter, she had bunnies. And I discovered that every rabbit has an individual personality. They had particular favorites in the group, and they expressed love for one another. I also found that they showed comfort and attention to me when I was sick by hopping onto the sofa. And they also expressed love for me with rabbit purring and kisses when I held them on my lap. It was clear to me that rabbits were far more intelligent than anyone had previously supposed. And after my experiences with my rabbits, I saw all animals with new eyes. But that was only the start of my journey to understanding our relationships with animals and the importance of the connections. My horse, Moonshine, who is a Morgan, whom I called Burgers, was an extremely successful show horse in several different disciplines before we settled on dressage. I had an instructor who I thought was very good, but her approach was bordering on abuse. One day, 
she jumped off of my horse and stormed out of the arena saying, this horse is hopeless and stupid. I didn't know what to do. I had no courage and no confidence. And she left the ring. She said, you can go ride with Olympian Lendon Gray up the road, or you can bring your horse to Linda Tellington Jones, but I'm finished. I went home utterly defeated. When I told my then husband, Jack, about this, he said calmly, all right then, let's call those people and make some appointments. A month later, I was at a two week long Tellington T-Touch horse training. Linda Tellington Jones has developed a system for the care and training of animals and she herself was leading this class. The first afternoon, I stood there introducing my horse, reading down his resume of show accomplishments. When I put my papers down, Linda gently stroked Burgers and said, Burgers is very intelligent and he is very beautiful. No one had ever said that about my horse before. I saw him with new eyes in that moment. I saw that he was more than just a show horse who could win trophies and ribbons at shows, but I saw him for who he really was. And it was only because Linda Tellington Jones had looked deeply into his eyes with respect, compassion, and love, and acknowledged his brilliance. Later that afternoon, Linda turned to the group and said, why do we have horses? Do we want to teach them to do things to win, to win ribbons and trophies at shows? Or do we want to dance with them? I knew immediately that I wanted to dance with my horses. I wanted to have a partnership of equals. I wanted us to find spiritual togetherness and happiness. I wanted my horse to be my best friend and I wanted to be his best friend. This work led me to decide in that moment that I would become a Tellington T-Touch practitioner. I would become a professional horse trainer and leave my life as an English teacher. And Burgers and I went on to ride with Olympian Lendon Gray. We did many dressage performances at a very high level with music without a bridle at a time long before people were considering riding without a bridle of any kind. I also, through T-Touch, saw the connection between pain and fear in an animal's body and the animal's behavior. And that led me to my current career as a holistic physical therapist for animals, as well as developing craniosacral therapy for animals and writing a book about how we can enhance our relationships with the animals in our life. First, in order to make a connection with my horse, I had to become acutely aware of the signals I was sending him with my body. Animals are exquisitely sensitive to subtle cues in our breathing, our gaze, our posture, even our thoughts. They know when we are angry, displeased, anxious, or filled with love and compassion. And becoming aware of my body language is what helped me when I was working with that horse, Bubba, the white stallion. I had to use every part of my body, my posture, my gaze, my stance, to convey to Bubba peace. But when you're working with an animal as terrified as Bubba was that day, it takes more than changing your outward demeanor. You have to become a person who can convey compassion and respect for that animal, for what he had endured at the racetrack. I needed to make a connection between our hearts, indeed a bridge between our hearts. At the HeartMath Institute in California, they've been researching the intelligence of the heart. They have been also looking at the role of the heart in our emotions and the role of the heart in our ability to make connections. They have reported that the electromagnetic field of the human heart extends 15 feet from the body. And with the much larger hearts of horses, that field likely extends much further. In fact, when we are within that range with our pets and making a connection, we are indeed making a heart connection. Furthermore, They've talked about heart coherence. Heart coherence is when your body rhythms are in synchrony with your heart, your breathing, your respiration, your blood pressure, and that translates to when our body's synchrony and heart synchrony is in connection with our animals. In fact, this heart coherence has an app. And people have been using that app when they're riding their horses or walking their dogs in order to slow their own heart rate so that they can be in heart coherence with the animals in their lives. 
Another way that you can make a heart connection with an animal is with a Tellington T-Touch heart hug. Let's try this. You're going to cross your hands over your heart, make a connection with your skin through your clothes. You're going to imagine the face of a clock with the six towards your feet. And you're going to push that skin around in a circle and a quarter back to the nine. Exhaling as you come to the nine. Now, as we do this, imagine an animal that you love and something you love about them or a person that you love and do another Tellington T-Touch heart hug. You will find that your body and emotions will quiet and you will indeed have made a connection with the animal that you imagine. And this is a great thing to do after a stressful day at work before you go into the house to greet your cat or dog or before you get out of the car at the barn to see your horse or even before you fill your bird feeder. This will help you be your best self with the animals in your life. Much of what I learned about relating to animals and respecting their intelligence, I learned from my mother. Soon after I was born, she adopted a red cocker spaniel puppy named Toby. And Toby loved my mother more than anything and followed her everywhere. He adapted when my sister, now a veterinarian, was born a year later. And he became our constant companion and best friend. My mom was busy with two small children, a job, and a husband often away for work. And she had no time to walk her dog. So she had to put him on a line outside when it was time to do his business. Sadly, the neighbor boys threw sticks at him and teased him. And Toby growled ferociously, defending himself. My mother was so afraid that he would bite them that she chose instead to give him away to a friend. It just so happened that one day that friend and my mom were in the small town where my mom still lives today. And Toby jumped out of the friend's car and into my mother's car where he rode home unnoticed. <laughs> he ran away several more times to be with my mother. And finally, we moved to a new house by a lake. Whoops, go back. When we got to this house, Toby took rowboat rides with us in the summer, and he trotted behind us on the ice when we were skating in the winter. It was a great place for him. One day, my mother was bundling us up, and she'd already let Toby outside to go do his business before we left the house. And she looked out the big kitchen window, and she yelled, Toby! We looked out to see our dog half submerged under the ice. 50 feet from shore, frantically paddling, barely breaking the ice ahead of him. The three of us ran out of the kitchen, ran through three neighbors' backyards where we set upon a rowboat, put it on the ice, used the oars to smash the ice, and row our way out to save our dog. My mom is petite, but she had no problem picking his 40 pounds up out of the ice into the boat where she wrapped his shivering body in her coat to keep him warm. My sister and I rowed to shore. My mom carried him back through three backyards into our house where we dried him and put blankets on him and kept him warm by the fire. Soon enough, he was playing with us again, and he was fine. But my mom risked her life to save a dog, and she would do it again. And she has company. Over 59% of women say they would risk their lives to save a pet. And I wonder how many of those pets would risk their lives to save their people. My mom's advice to us at horse shows was, smile, honey. As we were riding around the ring smiling, we didn't know it, but smiling was releasing serotonin in our brains, which helps us make a connection with an animal. Furthermore, new research has shown that smiling and gazing at an animal releases serotonin and the bonding or trust hormone oxytocin in you and the animal that you're smiling and gazing at. So this is Tristan. He's a Pembroke Welsh Corgi and my animal companion. When I smile and gaze at Tristan and he looks at me, our brains are awash in oxytocin and serotonin. <laughs> and we're both happier. And we indeed have a heart connection. <laughs> and I never doubted. Thanks to my mother, the animals love us as much as we love them. Right, Tristan? And in fact, recent studies have shown that dogs exhibit levels of empathy comparable to humans. Recent studies show that a dog would pull a string to give a treat to another dog, especially one that he knew. Why is this? 
animals or social beings, they want, need, and seek connection with others in their groups. And they also have a large amygdala, part of the emotional center of the brain. Dogs and mammals are, in fact, hardwired to respond to others in need. And there are hundreds of stories of animals risking their lives to help people during fires, coming to the rescue when a person has been injured, staying with a person who's been hurt, and also befriending other species. Lassie is far from the only dog who could tell us that Timmy has fallen in the well. <laughs> My friend, Dr. Bernie Siegel, says that we are all animal communicators. Who has not had these conversations with your pet? Is it dinner time? <laughs> Want to go for a walk? Want a treat? Where's your toy? <laughs> who loves you more than anything? Most of the time, our animals <laughs> respond. <laughs> All of us have told our friends our animal surely understands English because he goes to the door when you say walk and sits by the treat jar when you say treat. <laughs> animals, on some innate level, get us, and we get them. Dr. Doolittle is not the only one who can talk to the animals. And in fact, in this time of dog whispering and horse whispering, Animals really need from us to listen to them. Listening to animals includes acknowledging their posture, their stance, their gaze, their emotions, really making a close connection with them and seeing the message that they have for us. Part of that means paying close attention and using observation to pay attention to what your animal has to teach you. In fact, Listening to animals can help you even with your bird feeder. If we come home after a busy day at work and we're rattling the bag, numping the seed into the feeder and hurrying back indoors, the birds will be anxious around your feeder. However, if you take a minute to do a Tallington heart hug before interacting with the birds in your yard, your dog, your cat, your horse, or even your goldfish, you will be the kind of person that your animal wants you to be. And in fact, you might be the kind of person you want you to be. I encourage you to take some time to connect with the animals in your life. Try meditating with your cat. Try doing yoga with your dog. Find out what your pet's favorite treat is and give it to him. Massage your pet daily. Teach your hamster to play catch. Teach your cat some tricks. Make your pet a favorite meal. Doing this will help you make a connection with the animal in your life. And it might help you with a training issue, but it will really help you have a relationship with your animal. Why do we have animals in our lives if not to make a connection with them? Connections bring our, li our animals and us fulfillment and happiness and purpose in our lives. When we come to an animal out of respect, and compassion and love, they will show us remarkable qualities. If we listen to the animals, whoops, we lost that. If we listen to the animals, we can share in the dance of understanding with them. <laughs>